You're muted, Irvin. There we go. As always, a picture of the week for module number six. This chapter is all about security through network devices. The things that we forget exist on our network, yet can pose a threat uh, for our network, especially if they are misconfigured or even worse, if everybody forgot that said device existed on the network. Starting with a bridge. Well, bridges are very useful in connecting two separate networks together. They can also be a vulnerability. If a secured wired LAN and a unsecured wireless LAN were to be joined, the secured LAN would be exposed and security compromised. Thinking about this another way is uh, when's the last time you checked your network to see if there's a new device? And how would you check on a, on a company network that a bridge hasn't been installed? Have you looked at, at your network topology and, and check to see if there is another device on the network? Switches, and specifically smart switches, should all have loop protection enabled uh, using 802.1D to mitigate broadcast storms. That doesn't mean that a brand new switch that you buy today out of a central computers or micro center uh, has the capability, but it's not enabled. You might have to enable it. Attackers can overwhelm a switch's memory with spoofed MAC addresses, causing the switch to enter a fail open state, turning it into a hub. The problem with a switch turning into a hub is that everybody on the switch can see the traffic. Besides the network performance issues that arise with using a hub, a switch becoming a hub uh, for us, for our focus, that is a vulnerability because everybody can see everybody's traffic. Routers. When is the last time you looked at your router configuration? If you haven't looked at your router configuration in a while, you probably should. You should also make sure that your router is up to date. If it is no longer supported by the manufacturer, it's probably time to buy a new one. There is also load balancers. These devices provide an advantage through the services they support by detecting and stopping attacks directed at a server or application. Some load balancers can also hide HTTP error messages or remove server identification headers from HTTP responses, denying attackers additional information about the internal network. That's a good thing. You don't want your system saying what they are, what operating system they're running, what application is running out to the world. Because it is very easy to then see that and either create or find vulnerabilities that exist for that specific application and that specific version number and launch a successful attack. Proxies, whether they are reverse, application, uh, reverse, transparent proxies, no matter what, no matter which type, they all provide the same functionality in different forms. Proxies are able to increase network speed due to caching material and therefore reducing bandwidth usage, providing greater content control and intercept any malicious activity before it reaches the client. The problems with proxies, 
Number one, because they're caching information, they are a target for attackers. Because if you can get into that box, into that proxy, you now can see where everybody has gone. You see the cache and then you could inject malicious content into that cache and have it spread out into the internal network. Proxies also store who has been where since they have to keep a record of that because that's the whole purpose of a proxy is, on, is to connect to a service on behalf of a client. So if that is, that is being stored, which it should be, then that is prime information for an attacker to use. Some of the, the fences that we have, we have firewalls. They exist in two main forms, hardware and software. Firewalls can host, network, or application base. Host-based firewalls should be set to implicit deny, as hosts are not meant to provide networks with resources, only to consume them. So for example, a laptop should not be running a web server. It should not be hosting files to share. That is all the job of a server, not the end client. Network-based firewalls are further divided between the stateless and the stateful packet filtering. Stateless firewalls allow packets to pass because it's intended for a specific device on the network, whereas a state full would not let the packet pass if the internal, internal device did not first request information from the external device. Irregardless, all firewalls work by access control lists with rules containing items such as source address, source port, destination port, protocol, direction, and action. Application-based firewalls focus at level seven of the OSI model and filter at a granular level. One of the most famous of the application-based firewalls is the web application firewall or WAF, where they don't focus on any of the lower levels in the OSI model. It's just layer seven. Another way that we can protect our users, especially those who are remote, is VPNs. They can be software or hardware, aggregating all VPN traffic for a network. They can create and monitor remote access and site-to-site -site VPNs. A full tunnel will take all data going in and out of the network through the VPN, a split tunnel will not. The split tunnel will take some information and let it go through whatever normal means, and then the other would go through the VPN. So for example, uh, in a full tunnel, a user of a company would have all their, all their network or all their traffic routed through the VPN. So if that user goes to a personal site, that'll go through the company network, whereas if a user was in a split tunnel, they could access their email, let's say, through the VPN, but be able to also access Netflix locally. Those have their pros and cons. Because in a, in a con for a split, it could mean that an attacker could trick the user into going to a site they shouldn't and then having that routed through the, the split tunnel. Therefore, using that, that victim as the pivot point between that internal network and them. Full, the con to a full tunnel would be that all users have to route everything through there. So uh, you can see what they're doing. So privacy can be an issue. But you know, uh, uh, the reverse, the pro for a full tunnel is no matter what's happening, you can see and you can, you can react as needed based on attacks that are happening. 
and a split tunnel, you'll only focus on your work communications and anything that's, that's odd you can take out. There are also mail gateways that are responsible for blocking unwanted content like spam, phishing, and malware that, that could also read through email and prevent sensitive data from being transmitted. This would be a great thing to add to policies to say, hey, uh, all email coming in and out will be read by a, a system to see if there is any sensitive data and block those emails from going out. Intrusion detection systems or IDSs detect and alert when an attack occurs. They can be applied in a variety of ways, such as inline, passive, in band, and out of band. The monitoring methodology is the same regardless of the application. IDS employ a variety of things like anomaly monitoring when something is weird and new, signature-based monitoring similar to antiviruses, behavioral monitoring to find again an abnormal activity, and heuristic monitoring trying to be predictive. IDSs are applied at the host level, and those are called HIDS, Host Intrusion Detection System, and Network, NIDS. HIDS can watch system calls, file access, system registry settings, host input output, but can't see the network. A NIDS can see the traffic in the network, but can't see the, lo the host's local activity. So ideally, you want to put the two together. You want to have a uh, host intrusion detection systems work in parallel with network in order to get a full view when an attack occurs. Intrusion prevention systems do the same job as detection, but with the exception that a prevention system will stop an attack. Now you would think that an IPS is better than an IDS, but it actually depends on the situation. Because for example, it could be that you need a certain piece of infrastructure to be connected at all times. And you need to be able to monitor and report when things occur. For example, as a honeypot, the honeypot will lure attackers to it. You don't want a system to automatically cut any attacker off who is, who is thinking about making their way into your network. You want to be able to detect it, be alerted by it, but let them do their thing and watch. In a case like that, an IDS is the way to go versus your internal network. If you know a certain attack is happening, you want to prevent it from getting in to retrieve sensitive data, that's where an IPS would come in place. So it really depends on which one of the two you deploy, or if you do a mix of the two, and part of your network has an IDS to detect, and, I, and another net, part of the network has an IPS to respond. You also have the Security and Information Event Management, or SEAM. SEAMs consolidate real-time monitoring and management of security information with analysis and reporting of security events. SEAMs will aggregate data across multiple sources, correlate the data in a searchable fashion, automate alerts and triggers for events, ensure data is properly time synchronized and handle all kinds of logs. The tool that we will be focusing on in this class later on is Splunk. If you've never heard of Splunk, you will be going through the Splunk Fundamentals 1 course uh, later, in, later in the course. So implementing security through network architecture. One way that we can apply security to our network is by creating a demilitarized zone or DMZ. They function as a separate network that rests outside of the secure network perimeter 
allowing untrusted users from using services in the DMZ while protecting the internal network. Home routers that have a DMZ function are not exactly true DMZs. The functionality really just exposes a device to the internet by forwarding all ports at the same time uh, to that one device. A real DMZ is a completely different network that is air-gapped from the internal network. So in the case of this picture, we have a web server and an email server along with a database and application. Our database server should not be pointed out to the world because it's going to have valuable information. Same with our application server, that'll probably have important files of our clients, of our intellectual property and whatnot. So that really shouldn't be facing out to the world. But our email will definitely need that to be connected outside. And our website will definitely need to be ac accessible to the outside. So we're gonna put those on a completely separate network with their own firewall and their own switch and uh, any communications coming in and out of the web and email server will not in any way touch the internal network. They'll be two separate. We also have the network address translation. This is true for IPv4 allowing IPv4 devices to use one public address and still connect to the open internet. This is also true for port address translation. IPv6 does not require NAT or PAT as there are enough addresses available for every device to connect to the internet on their own without having to aggregate them all to one. So pros and cons. Right? If you're an IPv4 network, that you have to share a IP address. If you're an IPv6, you don't have to share. So you could restrict the network at a bottleneck in IPv4, but it, everything's more open in v6. Pros and cons to both. This is something that should be done everywhere, regardless if you're v4 or v6, is network segregation. Depending on the data level sensitivity, like confidential, secret, or top secret, the devices and physical hardware may need to be physically separated or air gapped to prevent them from being stolen by an attacker. Networks can also be segregated within the hardware in place by virtual LANs. By tagging packets, only those devices whom switches know are part of the virtual LAN will receive those packets. Other devices will not be able to read the traffic. Now I will say that network segregation by VLAN is not foolproof. And honestly, nothing is. But air gap does make things much harder. In an air gap system, these two switches are not connected to each other or this switch. They are physically disconnected from each other. They are physically different networks. A VLAN will allow multiple networks connected together and separate them on, you know, in the packet. The thing is with VLAN, it is totally possible to take a packet, give it a VLAN, and then encapsulate that in another VLAN. It is totally possible and very easy to do with a tool like Scapy to take a, a malicious packet leaving out of accounting, let's say, and have it make its way to engineering, even though it shouldn't because they're separate VLANs. It is totally possible to take control of this machine and make a packet that will that will run through the network and all the switches will see the first layer and take out that layer as it goes and then realize oh there's another layer another vlan layer okay well 
This packet is destined for VLAN 10, so there it goes. It is not unheard of for attackers to be able to jump VLANs just by encapsulating the, the packet, the malicious packet. And then when the response comes back, it'll come back just the way it came. So the, yeah, the VLANs are not foolproof. Another way to secure your network would be network access control. NAC allows network admins to put new devices in a quarantine state while an agent installs or runs in memory to verify the health and state of the incoming device before allowing it on the secured network. This can prevent an outsider bringing a device that's infected and trying to join. This is a good thing. Once we get back into life as usual and people going back on site, they're gonna bring a lot of their home systems with them. And you as a sysadmin or a network admin won't necessarily know what they've done with those systems. Are they up to date? Do they have all their patches installed? Do they have an antivirus that's up to date? You know, Do they have security measures in place or are they just the admin and just willy nilly running whatever they want. Having a network access control setup would, would force the incoming system to be quarantined for a bit, to have some system install or run, some application install or run on it to check its health. And if it's in good health, then allow it to join. Otherwise say, no thanks, that's a good thing. There is also data loss prevention. DLP is a series of tools that is used to recognize and identify data that is critical to the organization and ensure that it is protected. DLP protects data in any of the three states, in motion, at rest, and, uh, such as preventing a user from copying data into a USB drive or attaching it to an email. DLP is deployed via network sensors to watch the perimeter of the network, storage sensors to monitor data at rest, and agent sensors at the endpoint devices to copy, to prevent copy of an unauthorized location, such as USB. In theory, DLP sound great. From a network admin perspective, they're, they're preventing any user from exfiltrating data. From the user standpoint, they have to understand that they are constantly being monitored, like Big Brother. This is literally Big Brother. Because everything that is being done from one sender to a receiver, or from a, a computer to a USB or whatever, all of those things are being monitored. And they'll you know, the activity will be taken if somebody uh, somebody tries to send an email with sensitive information or tries to copy information out. Now, the only way that that's possible is to watch them and see what they're doing. So while D DLP sounds great for admins, just remember that it is just one big uh, surveillance of the users. And that should be something that's talked about with the users, should be something that is ironed out and written in policy before, it's, it's, uh, before it takes effect. Because the last thing you want is to deal with lawsuits and deal with all kinds of other shenanigans over installing something like DLP for the safety of everybody. Any questions? I don't see questions in Zoom. I don't see questions on Discord. And I don't see questions in YouTube. So I'm going to stop this recording and make a 